So um, yes, today my task is to defend uh, super determinism. And uh, I have noticed that if I talk to an audience where a lot of people are working in the foundations of quantum mechanics, um, I sometimes have trouble explaining where I'm coming from. So I thought I would start with briefly explaining what what got me to work on this in the first place. So originally, um, I'm from the particle physics area. Um, I've worked for some time on the phenomenology of physics beyond the standard model. And then I have, as you just heard, I've worked for a bit on uh, the phenomenology of quantum gravity. And now I mostly primarily work on uh, dark matter modified gravity, also from the phenomenology phenomenological perspective and I've always been a little bit disturbed that in the foundations of quantum mechanics there basically isn't any such thing as phenomenology you have people working uh, on the experimental side yes and then you have a lot of people talking about the interpretation of quantum mechanics but when it comes to the development of models beyond quantum mechanics you know that could improve the situation there's very, very little. They're basically the models with spontaneous collapse, and that, that's well and fine. But again, from my perspective as a particle physicist, I find that quite unsatisfactory because it's very hard to me to see how you could include um, that kind of non-deterministic, non-local collapse into a quantum field theory, which is what we eventually have to get to to reproduce the standard model. And that's why I am working on super determinism. And as, as will become clear in a moment, um, I didn't start out wanting to work on super determinism, just turns out that the kind of theory that I think solves a problem in quantum mechanics is also super deterministic. So this is a talk about the foundations of quantum mechanics, but not about the interpretations of quantum mechanics. I'm actually putting forward a new model that's a more complete theory, which gives rise to quantum mechanics. And in this talk, there will not be a lot of references just because it's really cumbersome, um, but we have other references uh, in our paper. So um, I, with apologies, but I, I didn't add a lot of paper references here. Okay, so first let me explain what my problem is with quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics is arguably a very successful theory, but it can't be how nature fundamentally works. And that's not because it's unintuitive, though it is. Uh, and it's also not because uh, it's ugly, which actually I don't think it is. You know, I, 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 quite, I, I quite like the mathematics of quantum mechanics, but it's because it's axiomatically inconsistent. Quantum mechanics uses two equations as dynamical law. You have the Schrodinger equation, uh, that's a linear equation. And then we have the measurement update uh, that's sometimes called the collapse of the wave function. And that leads to the measurement problem. So um, in a nutshell, the problem is that quantum mechanics can be used to describe ensembles Yes, but uh, it's also a theory for individual particles. So suppose, like take the simplest thing you can think of. You have a single photon and forget everything about entanglement. You just take the photon and uh, you push it through a beam splitter and it creates a superposition that's equal parts going to the left and equal parts going to the right. Uh, so far, so good. Um, now the problem is that the moment you measure the particle, it's 100% either on the left side or on the right side. And uh, this 50-50 superposition is just not something that we ever observe. So this update of the wave function is necessary to correctly describe uh, what we observe. And decoherence does not solve the problem. Decoherence tells you why, um, tells you how you convert 
uh, a quantum mechanical mixture like in the density matrix into a classical probability distribution. But it doesn't tell you how you get from this 50-50 situation to a situation where you have the particle 100% on the one side and 0% uh, on the other side. And so this measurement process in quantum mechanics is clearly not linear. Um, that's very easy to see because um, if you had just sent the particle 100% to the left detector, then that's just what it would remain. And if you were to send it 100% to the other detector, that's also what it would remain. But the superposition which you have created with the beam uh, splitter does not end up being a superposition of these two measurement outcomes. Instead, it's it's always either one or the other. So this means that the, the measurement process is not compatible with the Schrodinger equation. Uh, that's kind of obvious because otherwise we wouldn't need it, right? We actually do need this additional assumption. But if quantum mechanics was a fundamental theory, then the measurement postulate should be unnecessary because the detector is ultimately also made of particles. So you should be able to derive exactly what happens in the measurement, but you can't do that. And so to me, that's the problem. Um, yeah, so um, the one alternative, of course, I should mention, um, you either need a, a theory from which you can derive the behavior of a macroscopic object like the detector from the behavior of its constituents, or you just boldly give up on reductionism. Uh, but for this, there, there isn't even the theory. Um, so so I, I'm leaving this aside here because I don't really know how to make sense of this, uh, even theoretically. The measurement problem uh, has remained unsolved, um, though, of course, there has been a lot of talk about it uh, in the, the Copenhagen interpretation on neo-Copenhagen approaches like uh, cubism. Um, those all bring back the problem um, by referring maybe not to detectors uh, and uh, collapse, but referring to terms like the knowledge that's held by observers. And, and again, that, that just brings in some macroscopic um, notion of something that, in principle, if the theory was fundamental, should be derivable. Many worlds, uh, long story uh, made short, um, also requires a postulate um, to be able to actually derive what we observe. It's one thing to say, well, actually, all these different measurement outcomes happen somewhere in the many worlds, in the multiverse, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, in principle, that's fine. But of course, that's not what we observe. We don't actually observe all the measurement outcomes. We only observe one. And whatever way you put it, if you actually want to describe what we do observe, you have to make sufficiently many assumptions um, to to get back Born's rule with the collapse of the wave function. And it's just that they, you know, the many words people put in different forms and have different arguments, but, but in the end, it's just mathematically equivalent. So to me, it doesn't actually solve any problem. And I, I want to make really clear though, that it's not that I, I'm somehow against many words is as good or as bad as quantum mechanics. Uh, collapse models, um, solve the problem, um, but um, you need to tell the the collapse, uh, the master equation of the collapse model, what's the state to collapse into. Usually they um, choose the uh, position eigenbasis, but in principle it could be anything. And uh, pilot wave theories um, also kind of solve the problem, but they require an explicitly non-local ontology as with the guiding field that has to be updated and that's really hard to make compatible with quantum field theory and general relativity i'm not saying that it can't be done i i know there are some people who have tried uh maybe it's possible to push that forward but personally i don't really see how that's how that's supposed to work i, I think the 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 better thing to try is to come up with a theory that's local and lawrence invariant from from the very start. And um, so to me, it's like a, the obvious explanation for, for what we observe is that quantum mechanics is an emergent theory and the measurement postulate is an effective description for a process in a more fundamental underlying theory. And uh, as I just said, um, since the measurement process is non-linear, we know that this underlying theory also has to be non-linear. 
And so uh, it's, it's what goes under the name hidden variables theory. Uh, in principle, um, the, the measurement outcome is determined um, by something that's called a hidden variable uh, by definition. And uh, the time evolution of um, the, the fundamental theory has to be nonlinear to correctly reproduce our observations. And um, this idea is certainly supported by the kind of obvious similarity between the classical uh, Liouville equation for the probability density and uh, the von Neumann Dirac equation for um, the density matrix. Though, of course, you know, the one thing is an operator, the other one is a function, and the, the differences for the Hamiltonians. But it's kind of obvious just by looking at it that these equations are very, very similar. And I think this is very strongly suggests that quantum mechanics is actually um, not a fundamental theory, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, a theory that describes the statistics of a more fundamental underlying nonlinear theory. And um, so now why super, why the heck uh, would I want to choose something as ugly as many people would think uh, as super determinism? Well, as I said, it's not that I started out thinking, well, it has to be super deterministic. It's just that that's what you get for the following reason. If you want to replace the measurement update with a collapse process that is both deterministic and local, then the prepared state must have information about what's the eigenstate that it's supposed to collapse into before it reaches the detector. If it only finds out what's going on at the detector by the time it's there, then you necessarily have to somehow get this information about what happens on the one side of the detector to the other side, because by the time, say, the wave function on the left side figures out, oh, I'm supposed to be in an eigenstate here, the wave function on the other side has to know, well, it's not there. And if you start this process too late, you can't do it locally. So the information about exactly what are the detector eigenstates has to be in the evolution law. So the particle knows where to go, roughly speaking, where to go in configuration space, uh, in a sense. And as a consequence of that, the distribution of the hidden variables that determine exactly what the outcome is at the time of measurement is correlated with the detector settings. So you have this conditional probability distribution for the hidden variables that are um, normally called lambda. Um, and they depend on the detector settings, that's the A and B. Uh, and that's a violation of what's called statistical independence and such theories are called super deterministic. So in a little more detail, what is super determinism? A super deterministic theory is a hidden variable theory that solves the measurement problem and it reproduces quantum mechanics on the average. So that's a psi epistemic theory, um, but it's psi epistemic because the wave function um, is, is an ensemble average, uh, not, in the same way as, say, Copenhagen is a psi epistemic because it denies the reality of the wave function. So um, the, the wave function just does not describe the fundamental reality. It's just an aggregate. So that's why it's psi epistemic. Um, it's deterministic um, and it's local in the sense of that it doesn't have a spooky action at a distance. So this process of collapse should not require the wave function uh, at a space like separated event to suddenly require some information of what goes on entirely elsewhere. So, so that's the thing that, that Einstein was worried about. And uh, once you, you want this, then it follows that this theory must violate statistical independence. Uh, and it, all, it also has to be nonlinear just because the measurement process is nonlinear. Also, you know, it's kind of obvious, but if you assume that it reproduces quantum mechanics on the average, then it reproduces quantum mechanics on the average. And I know that sounds terribly dumb, but I feel that I have to point this out because there are a lot of people always come to me and are like, but what about Bell's theorem? Or, or what about the so-and-so bound and the, this other inequality and so on and so forth? To which I can also only say, what if the theory reproduces quantum mechanics on the average? then it will also violate these inequalities and it, and it will obey this bound and so on and so forth in exactly the same way that quantum mechanics does. 
Okay, so you may say, well, but that's all entirely obvious, right? So we want um, a deterministic local theory. Um, and yeah, we can do it. Uh, it comes with a price. Uh, the price to pay is that statistical independence is violated. But so, so what? Like, why hasn't anyone ever looked at that? Uh, to which the answer is, because philosophers have put down super determinism as unscientific on day one, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, the, the first time anyone ever talked about it, and no one ever experimentally checked the idea. And basically, you know, my mission today here is to <laughs> try to convince you that someone should really, really look, <laughs> if not, maybe it's correct. I mean, look, maybe you think it's wrong, fine with me, but someone should really look. Okay, so well, let, let me briefly go through um, these uh, misconceptions. Um, them, most notably, there are three of them, and then they have some subcategories, but I, I'll, I'll stick with the three biggest one. Once it's unscientific, it would make science impossible and it would eradicate free will. So here's the first uh, one, uh, it's unscientific. It goes, the argument goes roughly like this. Um, Super deterministic theories are unscientific because they're necessarily void of explanatory power. Um, the idea is that you need to specify a lot of detail for the initial condition, which is then called fine tuning, or people talk of a conspiracy that somehow the detector setting um, needs to know what the hidden variables are or the other way around. The hidden variables need to know what the detector setting are. And uh, you could have chosen the detector setting in any which way, you know, by, I don't know, calling your grandmother and asking what she had for lunch. And depending on what she answered, uh, you would choose a different setting or something like this. And uh, the hidden variables have to be correlated with all these details about your grandmother and her lunch and, and so on and so forth. So basically, um, that's the argument. I dare to say this argument is obviously wrong because to reproduce quantum mechanics, uh, you don't need more assumptions than quantum mechanics itself. So um, the only thing really you need to do um, if you want to reproduce uh, quantum mechanics with the super deterministic theory is that this distribution of the hidden variables um, is just so that it reproduces uh, bond zero. And that's a perfectly fine assumption. Now you may say, well, that's kind of pointless because you 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 know just put in quantum mechanics to get out quantum mechanics. And I would agree that that's entirely pointless. I'm not advocating that this is something which you should do. I'm just saying this for this reason. This argument is obviously wrong because there's a very simple way to remove this fine tuning, which is just to assume that um, on the average you you reproduce Born's rule, and that will if you uh, express it as a condition on the initial values of the dis distribution of the uh, hidden variables will give you some kind of constraint and that will do exactly what you want and it does not require any fine tuning. And, um, you know, it's just because people always question <laughs> that this can possibly work. Uh, Sandra and I, we have um, cooked up uh, a toy model that demonstrates exactly how um, you can do that. And I'll say a little bit more about this uh, model later. <clears throat> so uh, this is just wrong. Okay, so uh, misconception number two, um, it would make science impossible. I mean, you know, all of science would die if we were to allow uh, violations of statistical independence. Um, you know, it just it couldn't work. So um, the, the first mistake of this argument is to assume that a correlation between the distribution of the hidden variables and the detector setting cannot explain anything. That's something that you actually have to show, uh, which no one ever does uh, if, if they lead such an argument. Uh, but even leaving this aside, there's a more, more serious uh, mistake is that you infer from the usefulness of the assumption of statistical independence for classical experiments, and, and so that's certainly a useful assumption in those cases, that it must also hold for quantum experiments. And that's just not an allowed inference. And, and I think it's just completely crazy because we, we know empirically that it's really, really hard to maintain quantum effects for macroscopic objects. So why the hell would you expect that a violation of statistical independence for um, you know, your, your photons or something like that 
would also lead to a violation of statistical independence in say i don't know your random control trial with cancer cells and uh something like that uh to me that's just entirely insane like the, the whole point of looking at a physical collapse model that turns out to be super deterministic is to explain why we do not observe um macroscopic states in um superpositions and also I, I think this whole argument is just really really silly because uh, you know um people who work on cancer trials for mice or something like this absolutely don't care what, what we're talking about in in the foundations of quantum mechanics so why the heck would it ruin the rest of science okay so this this is just plain nonsense uh, misconception uh, number three, this, this is like a really old story, of course, uh, is that it would eradicate free will. Um, the assumption of statistical independence in the derivation of Bell's theorem is often referred to as the free choice or free will assumption, um, which is unfortunately very suggestive. Uh, you know, it, it, it seems to tell you that um if these correlations exist then something's preventing you from you know twiddling a knob on your uh, on your detector or something like that so i think that's that's the way that people think about it uh, but uh, this assumption really has absolutely nothing to do with free will uh, to begin with choosing the detector settings does not necessarily require human actors uh, that's kind of obvious you can have a robot do it or a computer or what have you also, free will is generally hard to make sense of in any theory that's deterministic, and philosophers have discussed this like for, for more than 2,000 years. And it, it has absolutely nothing to do with superdeterminism in particular. And uh, thirdly, it, it's kind of nonsensical to complain that the laws of nature constrain what we can do. Um, that's always the case. And so that's, that's not specific to superdeterminism. Um, to maybe give you an example, it's kind of silly to complain, for example, that uh, you aren't allowed uh, to put two fermions into the same state uh, because of the Pauli uh, exclusion principle. But no one would say, well, that's constraining my free will, <laughs> right? Um, it's just the way that nature is. And that's the same way I think you have to think about uh, violations of statistical independence, just the way uh, nature is. And there are just certain things that you just can't do. Uh, okay, so so that's a red herring. You know, this, it, it really the whole argument about super determinism has nothing to do with free will. Um, yeah. So so what about Bell type tests? I feel like I have to I have to mention this because there have been some people in the published published literature who have actually claimed they have ruled out uh, super determinism. But the only thing that an observed violation of Bell's inequality tells you is that at least one of the assumptions of the theorem must be violated. Um, these observations cannot tell us which of the assumptions was violated. And the super deterministic theories by assumption give rise to exactly the same violations of Bell's inequality than uh, quantum mechanics and the Copenhagen interpretation or many words or what have you. So you, you just can't use these type of tests to tell apart super determinism uh, from any other interpretation of quantum mechanics or uh, what have you. Um, and so I'm a little bit frustrated that these seem to be the only experiments that uh, are being done. Uh, so um, to me, it's just a, a waste of time. We have to do other experiments and exactly what I'll get to in a moment. So I have to say a few words about uh, future input dependence. That's a term which uh, doesn't come from me, but was coined by uh, Ken Wharton. Um, if you have these violations of statistical independence at, at the time of measurement, so, so this equation that uh, is one of the assumptions to Bell's theorem is a statement about the correlation at the time of measurement, that raises the question, to some people at least, uh, where do these correlations come from? And um, since the theory should be uh, Einstein local, so there should be no spooky action at the distance, um, these correlations were either inscribed in the initial conditions of the universe, they, they have always been there, um, 
They were locally created in the distant past. And this is something which you can, to some extent, try to rule out experimentally. Or, and that's my favorite interpretation, they are enforced by local consistency conditions in the future. And I, I think if I talk a little bit about our toy model, it will become clear exactly what I mean by that. So now this, this third point, uh, the local consistency conditions in the future, some people like to call that uh, retrocausal. And I don't like this word for the following reason. Uh, in, in general relativity, we define uh, the causal order by light cones, and then we pick one direction of time as forward um, using some notion of entropy or something like that. And the thing that is in the past is by definition always the cause. So if you're trying to tell me that there's a cause in the future, that's that, that's an oxymoron. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And so this is why I I refuse to use the term retrocausality. Um, then there are some people who uh, have called it uh, it's teleological, um, and this term too I think is very misleading um, because if if you look it up, uh, you know the the context in which people have used. Um, the word te teleology, um, they use it to say that a process happens for a certain purpose. For example, um, evolution happened because um, it had to give rise to human life. And that doesn't really explain anything because uh, you put in what you try to explain in, in your assumption. Um, so you, you postulate the purpose, but then you can no longer explain it. And, and of course, that's not the point of uh, super determinism. Um, so I, I don't think that's um, a good way to talk about it. The theory should, of course, make predictions that you do not just assume are the case. Uh, OK, so I think this gives you an idea you know, what what um, my perspective is on super determinism. So now let's talk a little bit about how far people have gotten in formulating super de deterministic theories and models. Um, there are a variety of toy models for simple situations that's um, notably uh, two qubits, uh, because a lot of people have focused on bell type tests. So that's like the first thing they always uh, look at. And they demonstrate that quantum mechanics can be reproduced deterministically with these models. And it actually doesn't take a lot of violations of statistical independence. So uh, it can be done. Um, so, so these toy models are, are nice to some extent, but um, that, that they have a very limited use because you can only apply them to, to these specific uh, cases. Um, there, there are very few full-blown theoretical approaches uh, to super uh, determinism. Uh, and I think that's just because there are very, very few people uh, working on it. Uh, basically, there are only three. So I can actually go through all of them, uh, which I try to do like really, really briefly. Um, the one that you probably all know about is toothed cellu cellular automata approach. Um, which uh, he's written a book about, and you, you can also find the whole book uh, on the archive if, if you're interested. So that's a deterministic local quantum mechanical model with a discrete space and time. And it defeats Bell's theorem um, by postulating that only some of the initial states are allowed, which Tooth says that the, there's only one ontic state. Uh, and the one that is allowed um, leads to results that agree with quantum mechanics. And uh, I think that gets pretty close to the original idea that people had uh, for super determinism, the way that um, Bell was thinking about it, um, probably. Uh, but it also brings up the problem, at least to me, um, how do you choose the initial state? Uh, uh, and, and that's exactly this problem with the fine tuning that people worry about. Um, so how do you choose it? Uh, what, what are the requirements? How do you make sure that you, you don't need to put in uh, a lot of details um, in, into this assumption for the initial state? And um, 
I don't really know the answer. <laughs> so uh, you should ask him too about this. But yeah, so um, this is probably the most prominent model. Um, it's not, it wasn't the first one though. So, so there's actually an even older idea for super determinism, uh, which is um, Tim Palmer's invariant set theory. And the idea there is, is actually quite neat, it's, it's quite simple. Um, so uh, it, in this approach, uh, the the state space, so which um, in which basically the whole universe is in this uh, state space, uh, is not continuous, uh, but it's a fractal and has gaps. Uh, and uh, so the states that fall in the gaps do not exist in physical reality. So there are just certain combinations of detector settings and hidden variables that just don't exist. And um, you you can use that to create violations of statistical independence, uh, though I, I think also in this case, uh, it's not that uh, Tim actually started with the idea of wanting to violate statistical independence. It's just that it turns out that the theory has um, this property. So the nice thing about um, this idea is that um, on, on these fractals, you can construct uh, a measure of distance, which is different from the uh, Euclidean measure that tells you what goes wrong with this idea that it would take only a small change um, to you know completely get a completely different outcome uh, for for the measurement setting. Like you know if the, the if you remember the story about your what your grandmother had for lunch, you know if you I don't know a butterfly came by the window of your grandmother and she changed her mind and she had noodles and said, then you would have set your detector settings uh, to something different. And um, so in the, in the usual argument, that kind of little butterfly whereby would, be, would be a small change and people consider it to be something that can easily happen. Whereas if you think of it from this fractal perspective, then you would say, well, actually, that's a really, really big change. Um, because uh, on the measure of distance on the fractal, these points are really, really far away from each other. So roughly, this is the idea. And uh, this approach um, leads to uh, rather specific predictions that um, have recently been worked out in this paper, which I encourage you to look at, but I'm not going to talk about it in more detail. Okay, so then let me say a little bit more about my own way of thinking about it. Uh, as I already briefly mentioned, um, I think that the best way to realize super determinism is by a constraint uh, on a, a future um, space like surface. Um, and this surface is usually the, the time at which you make a measurement, you could you could do it later, but it, it doesn't really make any difference. So you put it at the time of measurement. And um, the idea is that um, you use a kind of path integral um, in which you look for the most optimal outcome. So you don't just sum over all the possible path, the way that you do it in the Feynman path integral, but you take a variation over the possible final states and ask which is the most optimal final state. And um, in the usual Schrodinger equation, if you just propagate a state forward, like think again of your photon that goes through the through the beam splitter and and uh, ends up in this superposition. That's fifty percent one side, fifty percent of the other. Um, if you if you only use the Schrodinger evolution, um, you will end up in a superposition of two macroscopic states that are the possible detector outcomes. And so this this would be a macroscopic, uh, highly entangled state. And the idea is that in the path integral, you have a measure that punishes um, a large amount of entanglement between macroscopic states. So the, the most ideal path that the, the photon or the particle, whatever is your prepared state, um, wants to propagate on is a trade-off between trying to stay on the Schrodinger evolution but also not trying to generate too much entanglement between macroscopic states. Um, so concretely, um, Sandra and I, we're, we're currently looking at a path that looks roughly like this. Um, so you uh, have 
you know, some, some kind of say that's a vector in the Hilbert space. This is all the usual stuff and, and you expand it in some kind of basis and uh, it has these coefficients, the A, I, J, K and so on and so forth. Could be, could be a really high dimensional Hilbert space. It really doesn't make any difference. And so in this path integral, you um, sum over all the possible paths in configuration space. So those are not paths in space time, but in configuration space. And in particular, they, they contain entangled space, they, uh, entangled states uh, and superpositions and so on and so forth. And this first term in the exponents so and the integral under the exponent, um, it, as you will probably have seen, it looks pretty much like the Schrodinger equation and indeed, um, if you have only the first term and you ignore this other thing that I called quantumness uh, with the scare quotes, um, then um, you can show that this just um, reproduces normal quantum mechanics because the state will evolve uh, on the stationary solution, uh, which is um, the, the state which just sol solves the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and I should I should also uh, mention here, um, for me at least, the major reason for um, writing it this way is that if the Hamiltonian is uh, Lorentz invariant, then the whole expression will be Lorentz invariant. Of course, if you take the non-relativistic limit, then it's not Lorentz invariant, but but that that won't surprise you. Okay, and then um, the deviations from quantum mechanics that induce this physical um, process of collapse are in this term, which I've sloppily called quantumness. That's basically a, a measure of the amount of entanglement between macroscopic states. And so this is where things get really complicated and we unfortunately have made a terrible lot of progress. There, there are a lot of measures for entanglement. Uh, you could just look them up in the literature. There are literally dozens of them. Um, th they all more or less work by taking the system and dividing it up in, in any possible way, and then uh, calculating the reduced density matrix and deriving some kind of uh, measure from that. The, and that's all well and fine. You know, you can mathematically write it down, but the problem is you can't analytically calculate anything with that. You know, you, you take any expression like that and you put it into the exponent in a path integral, and that's pretty much the end of the story. Um, so we're still working on it. You know, we're, we're trying to find a simple example where we would actually be able to write it down and, and to show how it works. Um, but yeah, so uh, admittedly, we're a little bit stuck with that. Um, therefore, we have instead put forward a little toy model, which I have to caution you should not be taken too seriously. Um, but it, it, it serves to demonstrate a very general point, which is that um, you do not need any fine tuning uh, in a super deterministic model just to reproduce quantum mechanics. So the way that this toy model works uh, very briefly is like this. So you have a, an n-dimensional Hibbert space. Um, and uh, again, we just work with, you know, normal wave function in that Hibbert space. And so there, there, there's nothing unusual going on um, with, with the Hibbert space and stuff like that. Uh, and we define n complex hidden variables. These uh, are the sigma n's and each of these variable uh, variables is uniformly distributed in the unit disk and they are all um, independent of each other. So, so it's really simple that there's, you don't need um, to put any information on that, certainly nothing about the lunch your grandmother had and so on and so forth. And then from, from these uniformly uh, distributed hidden variables, we define what's the actual hidden variable that will enter the evolution or these are the lambdas. And there is one lambda for each dimension of the Hilbert space, and it's just defined by this, um, you know, this expression. The important thing is that these coefficients, the alpha, uh, which appear here, are the projections of the prepared state. So that's the the psi uh, at the time of measurement. That's T D is the detection time. Um, uh, projected on the eth eigen detector eigen state. So um, this is basically just the coefficient that will give you the probability of measuring the system in state i. 
Um, and uh, then we define a whole set of Lindblad operators. Um, the, the, the thetas are just the heavy side function. So whenever the lambda is larger than zero, then it will be the one. And if it's smaller than zero, it's the other. And these Lindblad operators uh, are all added to the master equation, uh, as you see in, the, in, in this uh, last equation. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And uh, this model has the following properties. The evolution of any initial state, uh, of any initial prepared state, ends up in a detector eigenstate um, with all the off-diagonal elements in the density matrix um, exponentially suppressed. And, and from the diagonal elements, there's one that goes to one and then, then some tiny little epsilons uh, on the other entries on the, di on the diagonal. Exactly which eigenstate it is is determined by the hidden variables. So you just choose your sigmas once at the beginning, and uh, that will tell you exactly what the outcome is. When you average over the hidden variables, um, you reproduce Born's rule uh, by construction from the way that it was uh, set up. So it's a deterministic local collapse process that reproduces quantum mechanics exactly and there's no fine tuning necessary. Um, as I said, it's kind of unsurprising because we have assumed, if you're looking at this, this distribution of the hidden variables contains the information uh, about Born's rule. Um, so we put it in, and of course that's not any, you know, it's not any simpler than quantum mechanics, but it does not require the update of the wave function. So it doesn't run into this issue with the uh, non-consistency. Okay, so now let me say a few words about uh, experiment. So this this toy model um, actually can't be experimentally tested um, because we assumed it would reproduce quantum mechanics exactly. Um, you don't actually expect that to be the case for um, a realistic super deterministic model. The reason it happens here is that uh, we don't actually explain where the hidden variables come from. We just put them in and you know they're complex hidden variables and they're uniformly distributed and where the heck does that come from? Um, if you had a satisfactory super deterministic uh, model, you had some physical explanation for what the hidden variables are. And uh, then of course the distribution of those hidden variables could be different from one case to the other. And that would uh, generically lead uh, to deviations from Born's rule and that uh, you can observe. So that there's a fairly um, general condition uh, for super determinism, uh, which just comes from it being deterministic, right? That's the whole point. So the, the theory um, is deterministic and that means for identical measurement setups you know if if you reproduce the entire initial state uh, you will get identical measurement outcomes and that's not the case uh, in quantum mechanics quantum mechanics is an indeterministic theory and i would tell you that actually all these measurement outcomes are uh, entirely uncorrelated and uh, they're, they're distributed according to Born's rule if you repeat your experiment um, so what you should do to test this kind of theory is you should look for autocorrelations in a time series of measurement outcomes um, that according to quantum mechanics should be uncorrelated. Now, um, there is of course the problem here uh, with the hidden variables, which is that they are hidden. <laughs> so um, just by saying the theory uh, is super deterministic doesn't, doesn't actually tell you what the hidden variables are. And without specifying that, you you can't make any prediction. Um, so, and for example, the hidden variables in uh, Tooth's model are work completely different than they work in uh, Tim's model, and uh, work completely different than they work in my model. Um, but I think that the most minimalistic assumption that you can make. Uh, about super determinism is that the hidden variables are not actually new variables. You don't need to introduce any new degrees of freedom into, say, the standard model or something like that. Because if you remember, you know, um, I worked on the phenomenology of physics beyond the standard model for some time, and I can tell you it's it's really really difficult to introduce 
new variables into the standard model and uh, make them have an effect at low energies and, and all these uh, bell type tests and, and so on and so forth are experiment at low energies uh, compared to the LHC and so forth um, without someone already having noticed that. So um, I think what you want to do is you just want to use the variables that we know of already, which are the degrees of freedom of the detector and you know, the environment and so on and so forth. So I think that's the most obvious thing uh, to test for. Uh, and, and that basically means if you want to look for this autocorrelation, you want to look at a system that is as small as possible, just so you have as few degrees of freedom um, as you can possibly make it. It's cold, so it doesn't wiggle too much. The degrees of freedom don't change. Um, and you want to repeat um, your measurements in a rapid sequence, uh, just so the, the more time passes between two measurements, the higher the probability that something changed about your experimental setup. And uh, yeah, so, so that, that's roughly the experiment uh, that I, sh I think should be done. And, and it blows my mind that it hasn't been done already like 50 years ago or something like that. Okay, so, uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so, um, and to finish, I just <laughs> want to repeat like the most important point here. Uh, super deterministic theories are not interpretations of quantum mechanics. They are more fundamental theories from which quantum mechanics derives. Thank you for your attention. So Let's start uh, with uh, David Jackson. David, the microphone is yours. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, my question is that in regular quantum mechanics, when you look at something like the double slit experiment, you have, say, a photon being emitted and then detected. But quantum mechanics doesn't say anything about where the energy goes in between. Um, and that then also means that if you're trying to combine that with general relativity, um, you don't know what the space-time geometry is. You've got, say, a superposition. Um, does this say anything about kind of what the space-time geometry would be, or is it more consistent with general relativity? Does it say anything about that, or more generally, does it say anything about how you would go about combining this more fundamental quantum theory with general relativity? Uh, no. So uh, I I really can't say anything about this. Um, you're right, of course, that we still need a theory of quantum gravity that would tell us that would answer this question, right? Exactly the question that you're answering, like what happens with with uh, the space time in, in that kind of double slit experiment. Uh, and I certainly hope that uh, super determinism would make it easier because one of the problems uh, combining quantum mechanics with, with general relativity is uh, the measurement update, um, but I really haven't thought about it. So, and in the model that we're talking about, there just isn't anything with with space time. It's just Minkowski space. Um, so there's nothing with curvature, and there, there's no gravity, nothing. Okay. So okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, next in line, we have Hans Oettinger. Hans, please go ahead. Thanks, Antonia. Um, for me. You turned a bad day in a bad day with a happy end. So thank you very much <laughs> for your presentation. Um, I, I was wondering about the subsystem you have, the quantum system and the detector. I mean, I, I don't know what a detector is. So I assume that is just something in the rest of the world. So you're basically saying that everything is somehow correlated in, in, in the universe in a sense and in a non-local fashion, if I get it right. and. and the question I have, and I, I, I like the pictures of having immersions. I, I, I like to have nonlinearity. I think these are all very healthy ingredients. And um, what I'm missing is if if I do cost graining, as we non equilibrium thermodynamicists call it, if I do something in the spirit of an immersion theory, as you're suggesting, I would entropy expect to come in. And I would also expect irreversibility to come in. And then I'm immediately at the kind of quantum master equations, which are the best thing of a, but of a nonlinear type, not just of that linear type, which you had simplicity assumed in your toy model. So, and that I would probably consider not in quantum mechanics, um, because quantum mechanics for me is an approximate theory anyway. I mean, quantum field theory would be the better thing. Um, and there's some kind of, of, of low energy limit, which you may 
successfully described uh, by quantum mechanics. But so I would rather go to a quantum field theory setting Im immediately. I think I would basically do what you were suggesting, but I would I would feel kind of motivated to talk a lot about entropy and irreversibility. I, and you don't seem to feel that desire. I didn't get it. So any comments on on, on that is, would be welcome. Well, it's it's a very interesting point you raise. I've I've talked about this with my postdoc a lot um, because I think that this measure, which I just vaguely called quantumness, uh, is basically a measure of entropy uh, to some extent because it tells you what's the likely state that the particle is going into. But it's not the same entropy that you would get just in normal quantum mechanics. That's exactly the point. Because in normal quantum mechanics, um, you would get an increase of entropy if the entanglement just increases. And uh, instead, the evolution that we want to get at is that the most likely thing that the state can do is that it, it goes into a detector eigenstate. So something has to change about this notion of entropy from the quantum mechanical uh, case to, to the super deterministic case. But just exactly what it is, I don't, I don't know. That, that's the point that, that we're stuck on. I'm, I'm um, not sure whether it's a change of entropy or whether it's a change of entropy production. I think the entropy is the same, but there are different processes which lead to entropy production. And you apparently have something particular in mind there, which, which selects certain um, states. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean that the entropy is different, but I would say that's the, the irreversible process going on, which is different. I mean, the, the entropy would still be the von Neumann entropy, which would be over in a row in your, in your quantum mass equation setting. But how, how do you combine this with the fact that a different trajectory has to be the most likely one? Well, I think in, in, in density matrices, I don't think in terms of individual particles and trajectories. I mean, for me, the, the, the row is the primary object. The, 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 sorry, the density matrix row. Yes. So what I'm trying to say is that we, we, we need, in, instead of uh, going to the normal density matrix that will give you a statistical mixture, some entries on the diagonal, you need an evolution that will always bring you into a state where one of these entries is one and all the other ones are zero. Um, and this difference has to come from somewhere. So if you just leave the entropy to be the same one that it ever, the, the same that it ever, uh, that it always is, <laughs> then I don't see how you can possibly get a different outcome. I would use a super selection principle. So the new ingredient would be a super selection principle that transitions are possible only between specific states. And I would treat the quantum master equation by unravelings, um, which is pairs of trajectories in Hilbert space. But that, that's too technical. So the, 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 the key word I think is, I, I would not dwell too much on, on entanglements, but I would rather um, talk about super selection rules. And so this is not just from the con con standard quantum type of mixtures. Yeah. You, you can do a different thing on the level on, on density matrix matrices than you can do on the um, on the Schrodinger level. Yeah. So I mean it's easy to get from Schrodinger to, to density matrix, but not the other way around. And and so there you can do a lot of things. But but I should not take more time, I think. Well, well, thank you. It's very interesting. Uh, it's as I said, we, we we have talked about this, and I suspect actually you may be right that in the end you you have to go to a quantum field theory formalism and and then try to get back to uh, quantum mechanics. Maybe let me add one thing, which which you said at the very beginning about you have these correlations all over the universe and so on. Uh, technically, I think that's that's correct. That that's exactly what this kind of theory tells you. But practically, I think the only correlations that really matter are the ones between the prepared state and the detector up to the point where you're very, very certain that nothing is going to change about the outcome anymore, which is pretty much exactly the same point where you would say, well, decoherence has just destroyed um, the the uh, the superposition uh, or something like this. So in, for in practical purposes, that defines the detector, right? Sorry, the... in a sense, what you just said defines what a detector is. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yes, and and, and so so the rest of the universe is kind. Of, I mean, it's there, and, and and in principle, it should it should. Yeah, Thank but. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again for this wonderful, inspiring presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Peter Morgan left a question in the chat. Uh, he says uh, the toy model is stochastic and rather Nelsonian. Is it at all super deterministic? Um, so the toy model is not stochastic. Uh, I don't know why you would say that. So the if you pick the hidden variable, the outcome is just uh, deter determined. It, it will the state will evolve on one particular trajectory. So there's, there's absolutely nothing st stochastic about this time evolution. And I, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't know what Nelsonian is supposed to refer to. Maybe someone can fill me in. Uh, okay, uh, next in line, we have Karl Oifer. Karl. Uh, hi. Um, would you mind putting back up uh, the slide, the uh, uh, misconceptions number one? This one, yeah. Okay. Um, I, had, I had a questions about the middle two bullet points because um, first you're saying that uh, the argument that one needs to specify a lot of detail for the initial condition um is obviously wrong wait let's see uh, right you're you're in this bullet point you seem to be rejecting the charge of, of fine-tuning your conspiracy um or the need to specify a lot of detail for the initial condition but uh, doesn't that just follow from what happened what you gave a few slides earlier when you said that uh, um there's a violation of statistical independence. So the, the lambdas, uh, the row of lambda is not the same as row of lambda conditioned on uh, detector settings. So what's the fine tuning that you think, think is necessary? Since the, the, we know, well, we know that detector settings can be uh, chosen by a myriad of different um, procedures, which we are free to choose how, how we want the, the setting to be done. Look, take it by, by using the digits of pi or by getting the, the settings from Shakespeare's works, looking at every 10th letter and so forth. Yeah, that's exactly how the argument normally goes, right? But, but right. All, this, all this information is absolutely unnecessary. It doesn't even enter the theory. It never shows up. Uh, well, you mean it's, it's not... Uh, it's I mean just just look at the equation like where is it that the only thing that enters in this equation is the detector setting itself mm -hmm. you know the, it, it doesn't matter at all how you choose the detector settings the the only thing that matters is what is the detector setting at the time of measurement of course right that's all that's showing up in this I see I see your your point um, um, can you go back to the, yeah. This? The misconceptions, yeah. Um, the next bullet point uh, I didn't understand because it says, you said, you said the argument is obviously wrong because reproducing quantum mechanics can't possibly require more assumptions than quantum mechanics itself. Um, there's one sense in which I understand that if, if in order to reproduce you can quantum mechanical predictions you can just take quantum mechanics and then it's nothing more than quantum mechanics but in another sense um it doesn't seem right at all because one way you can reproduce quantum mechanical predictions is by being a bohemian and then you are taking more assumptions and putting more in by hand uh, quite a bit more than what quantum mechanics itself has so this the what you're saying here doesn't seem to be a, a very compelling thing to say you, you can you can reproduce quantum mechanics by putting lots more stuff in if you want and that and that is the way most people think about what happens in super determinism well i'm i'm the especially referring to the details that you supposedly need to put into the initial condition right i mean it, it's it's correct that you could of course have a theory that you have assumed will reproduce quantum mechanics but you have also made a lot of other assumptions uh, right but, but that's not the situation uh that we have with super determinism the, the question is just do you have to put a lot of detail into the initial condition and and what i'm trying to say is that 
Um, the answer is, in my opinion, obviously no, because you could always assume that this distribution has to be so as to reproduce quantum mechanics. And so it can't possibly be more difficult than quantum mechanics. But as I said, of course, then you can ask, well, what's the point of even doing that <laughs> like if, if, you have, if you have assumed quantum mechanics? To which my answer would be where you want to get rid of um, the, the measurement update. You, you want to replace the measurement update with a deterministic and local collapse um, to prevent the problem that uh, this leads to. Uh, and that, this is what uh, we were trying to prove with the, with the super deterministic uh, toy model that you can actually do that. You can just assume that this distribution on the initial state is so that in the end it will correctly reproduce quantum mechanics. So I have more questions, but I think I should uh, stop now and let others ask questions, and I'll come back in if. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. so if we will have a second round of questions, uh, for sure, uh, we will take your, uh, your questions. So uh, next in line is uh, Aurelien uh, Dreze. Aurelien. Yes, okay. so thank you uh, for, you can hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting, especially because uh, there are not so many talk about uh, super determinism and uh, this kind of theory are generally considered as uh, crazy, as you say. But uh, I found them extremely uh, interesting. And uh, probably there are more people work that you think that working on super determinism, but they are simply ashamed to admit it. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so my, my question is about one remark that you do, um, you, did, you present at the beginning when you say uh, for the motivation, uh, you speak about the determinism, about uh, uh, non-linearity and, and statistical independence, but. Uh, then you speak a bit about retrocausality, and finally, you, you, I, it was not clear for me what you think really about it, because my intuition is that uh, retrocausality in many cases will not be really much different from super determinism. If you simply throw a, a stone in a, in a paddle and watch the movie in the other direction, it will be completely conspiratorial. So, what do you think really about, uh, about this issue? Yeah, I, I, I think what you just said also expresses my opinion. Um, what I was trying to say with my slide about retrocausality is that I think the term is incredibly misleading, which is why I refuse to use it, because th the picture that people get is that there's some cause propagating back in time, mm -hmm. which doesn't really make sense. So, which is why I've adopted the term future input dependence from, from Wharton, though I, I'm not entirely sure that he actually likes the way that I use it, <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. But I think it describes the situation very well, because it points out that this difference um, between having a seeming conspiracy on some initial slice and, uh, and having a non-fine-tuned um, theory that draws on input in the future is a matter of perspective. It doesn't actually change the physics because you can, uh, you can either use the future input, which is the detector setting at the time of detection, or you can use your deterministic evolution equation and express this detector setting by a very complicated initial state that includes the lunch of your your grandmother and, and, and all that kind of thing. And then it will look conspiratorial, yeah, yeah. but it's it's the exact same physics. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next in line, we have Lorenzo Maccone. Lorenzo, please go. Okay, so, sorry. Uh, well, first of all, I, I think it's very nice that somebody has, uh, uh, is brave enough to, to present such radical ideas, which we really need. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, I have an objection about super determinism being unscientific, which is not something that you brought up, which is the following. I mean, physics, not all science, but physics in particular is, is based on induction. So you perform controlled experiments and then you use those to induce some physical laws. And then from these laws, you derive a theory. So you need to perform these controlled experiments in order to, to do that, to, to, to start the induction process. 
uh, but the idea of controlled experiments really fails if you have to worry about what happens in the future. I mean, the past you have under control because you can remember the past, but you certainly cannot remember the future. So, so if, if, you, if these correlations, as you said, are enforced by local consistency in the future, then you're in trouble. I mean, it's, science is not going to work because you cannot perform controlled experiments in this sense. Well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by controlled experiments. You know, I think that there might be a case to make that whenever you have a, a deterministic evolution law, it's rather unclear what it means that you can control an experiment if it was all written to the initial conditions of the universe. So, but that's a question I would leave to philosophers. Maybe let me say a little bit more about- Can, can, I, what, can I just answer? to that <laughs> i mean you you want to derive the coulomb law so you take two charges and you change charges and you change the values of the charge that's a controlled experiment that's what i mean i mean it's kind of trivial right well you so, so you try you try for 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 various values of the charges and you see that the force is proportional to the product of the charges i mean that's what i mean by controlled experiment so I don't really understand what your problem is. I mean, maybe let me put it this way. There are, there are two different types of changes that you can talk about. Like the change that you clearly have in mind is a physical change, right? You make one experiment, then you take away whatever, have you, your charge, whatever you put in different charge, uh, you make another experiment and so on and so forth. And then there are theoretical changes that, that you can do in the theory, um, virtual variations, basically, uh, but these don't necessarily correspond to physical changes. Um, do we agree with that so far? So um, I'm certainly not saying that um, these physical changes are somehow impossible. They are exactly as possible as they were previously. There, there are just certain virtual changes that the theory just doesn't allow because you have these correlations between uh, the detector setting and the hidden variance. So, so what, I, what I'm saying is that if you have to worry about things that you cannot control because they are in the future, you can control what happened in the past. You can remember that, but you cannot control what happens in the future. So how can you set up an experiment in which you have everything under control except for the values of the charges. I mean, that's how you produce a Coulomb law. You know, that, I, that I, I, would, I would disagree that I can control the past. I'm, I'm pretty sure I can't control no, the past. I, you know, the the you past is what, you whatever it was. remember the past, and so you can take into account what happened. And then you can, you can set up that, your experiment right. that takes into account what happened in the past. But you certainly cannot set up an experiment that takes into account what happens in the future. So, so that's, that, what I'm that's saying. right. But, but you don't do this. Uh, and you also don't do it in quantum mechanics. What you do is you make a conditional prediction. You make a prediction for any particular choice of a measurement setting. It's just the same way that you do it in quantum mechanics. You don't know what the measurement setting will be. It would be hideously difficult to predict it. Um, but that's not specific to super determinism. That's just always the case. Um, and uh, then you check whether this conditional prediction was correct. Once you've made the measurement, you, you know what the, what the setting was. Now it's in the past. And then you can check if it agreed with, with your prediction. So this measurement setting, which appears in, um, say, in, in the toy model in, in this distribution, um, is it's, it's not a fixed number. It's, it's some parameter that could in principle take on any number. You, you just don't know in advance which it will be because you can't predict the future as you, um, I mean, you could, but it would be very difficult and blah, 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 you know, human behavior and so on. Right, yeah. I, I think my objection was a little different than what happens to the experimental settings. I mean, it was more deep about how you have to 
how you construct a physical theory, but maybe I've already talked too much, so maybe uh, we should let somebody else talk. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo. Um, so next in line, we have uh, Sidant Das. Please go ahead. Um, thanks for the talk. So I had a question about the notion of locality in your toy model. Could we go back to that slide where you had the equation? Yes, very good. Um, because I realized that I didn't, uh, I didn't explain this very well. Yeah, uh, but you said it was local, so I wondered. You yeah, know. yeah. Um, okay, here we go. So it's local in the sense of not having spooky action at a distance. It is. It it does violate Bell locality, if that's the question. Um, at least that's the case for for all the models that I know. Um, so I, I I talked about this with Zandro to some extent whether it's possible to avoid it that you have a super deterministic theory which um, does not only violate statistical independence but that furthermore is bell local i suspect it's not possible <laughs> but um i don't really know we haven't we haven't been able uh, to prove it no i have a much more simpler uh, thought in my mind so the model that you presented is a n-level system of quantum mechanics and one of the simplest instantiations of that would be just an atom which is projected onto some five of its levels or something okay so for a single atom where you are interested in five levels of it nobody worries about locality right the problem arises when you have more than one atom which are spatially separated right so my question would be to put it more concretely so your model seems so, so as you said, you reproduce the predictions of quantum mechanics. As I understand it, if you work out the details of the model, you get the bond rule for the square coefficients of a general expansion, this initial state that you had, right? So that's all fine. But now let's, I mean, this is more like a, a question rather than I know how it will proceed. I imagine you have two, so you have these lambdas, the hidden variables, which may be some property of the atom, we don't know, could be anything. Uh, imagine having two such systems. And now these I's, which you, the initial state that you can have just in quantum mechanics can be entangled, right? That's where the interesting thing happens, which doesn't happen if you just had five levels. Okay. Now the question would be, well, to reproduce all possible measurement outcomes of such a system, um, would you, so do you have in mind some kind of generalization of this mechanism that you just produced for an N-level system that will work for two copies of the same system? Well, so this N-dimensional Hilbert space, it could be a, a many particle Hilbert space. It, it could be, uh, you know, five particles uh, and they could be interacting or they could not be interacting. It could really be anything. Mm -hmm. so, so it it includes all all possible cases, provided it's finite dimensional. And yes, I mean you're you're right in that. Um, so these eigenstates which we have here, like the um, the i, mm -hmm. uh, the i and the n and the m n and 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 so on and so forth. These are the um, eigenstate of the detector but if you have several detectors they're the eigenstate of the detectors and and they can be spatially uh in, in completely different places basically which is generically the case and it, in particular it's the case if you do the uh, bell type test that kind of thing you have two different detectors that are um, in different places if you have entangled state of two detectors how do you uh, interpret that in this framework entangled states of the detectors i mean for example uh, so here you have n levels as, as i was just imagining if you have two atoms two detectors so 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 maybe i was wrong to interpret these eigenstates as uh, you know like in usual quantum mechanics one would think of them to be states of a system like an atom 
But here you probably think of them as pointer states. Yeah, right? yeah, th th those are the pointer states. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry if I, I if I didn't make that very clear. Yeah, that's fine. So now if I have two detectors and I imagine a entangled state of like you know the, just you know take some symmetrized combination of these two, would that be an allowed state of this new system comprising of two detectors and two atoms? I mean, I understand the mechanism. So, I'm not exactly sure what, what you mean with allowed. So allowed, like in the sense that we actually measure it, we never measure yeah, that's... entangled eigenstates, right? I mean, pointer states, that, that's exactly the thing that you want to avoid, which is why the, these coefficients AI explicitly contain the pointer states. Um, to, so let me give you a, a very concrete example. So let's take two level system. So you have just n equals two and you take two. So you, you told me two minutes back that, you know, as long as the system is finite dimensional and you have a basis, for example, and then this mechanism will work. Okay. So now let's imagine first we have n equals two. So just zero and one, you should, for example, and you have this mechanism. Now, if I take two copies of the system, uh, you will have four levels, right? And you can, of course, choose different ways of writing. So I choose my basis to be these usual Bell states, for example, you know, like zero, one, one, zero, and I run this mechanism. Does that give me any physical picture as to what's going? Because previously the state zero would have meant the detector measures something and uh, state one would mean the detector measures something else. But now I have a basis where I have zero one minus one zero, which is supposed to be a state of the two detectors as a whole. And if I run this mechanism, I think the evolution will take you deterministically into one of these states as, is, isn't that correct? So I have these four pointer states, which I chose to be entangled in the usual sense. And this mechanism will just deterministically evolve into one of these states. What does that mean? So, so what you don't entangle the pointer states. I mean, so so suppose you have your two you have your two atoms and uh, you have your zero one state for the one and you have the zero one state for the other. Mm -hmm. And now you look at the combined system that now you have four states zero 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 one one zero uh, one one <laughs> right. Uh, and then you prepare your state in, I don't know, the signet state that you uh, seem to have in mind uh, or what have you. Um, the point is that the outcome of the time evolution will always be a detector eigenstate. So in that case, the, the, this thing, which I call the I, M, N, and so on, will run over all the combined bases. So so the i is not just zero one in this case, but it it runs from zero 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 one one zero and and so on. We actually have this example in in the paper explicitly. Um, okay. So as I understand, you allow ex only those product states to be the new basis states of the detector. I mean, I think saying that the states now are pointer states of the detector makes a difference to what states you are allowing, right? If I say there were states of an atom. And I have two atoms, I can very meaningfully imagine zero, one plus one, zero. Uh, but maybe there is just a, I, I should look up uh, the paper. Yeah, it's, it's by assumption these these things are um, the pointer states of the detectors, um, however many detectors there are. Um, that, that's just it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sabine, if you agree, uh, we can take a very last question. Uh, from uh, Carl, and uh, then we are done. So, Carl, please go ahead. Uh, right. It's a quick question about the experimental test idea that you were talking about at the end. Um, um, if, you, if I understood the idea, uh, the idea was to look for um, signs of determinism by doing repeated uh, in short time experiments and trying to make the initial conditions as much similar as you can. But how, how does that um, how does that become a test of uh, super deterministic type theory as opposed to a Bohmian type theory, which is non-local? In other words, would you, wouldn't you have to do 
uh, an experiment that both reveals the, the determinism uh, and, and the locality um, in order to really su support with an experimental test a uh, super deterministic model. Whereas, well, if I was understanding right, you were just basically looking for traces of determinism in the, in the true underlying physics, but that, that could then be Bohmian. Well, so I, I'm not an expert on pilot wave theory. Uh, maybe someone else has something to say about it, but I'm not aware that Bohmian mechanics would predict such a deviation uh, from Bohm's road. Instead, it's, it's constructed so that it will exactly reproduce uh, quantum mechanics and these the hidden variables that are the particle positions, the, the, the Bohmian particle positions, um, are by construction not not observable. So I mean, you're right in 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 the sense that um, you test a specific model for super determinism. You don't um, test all the properties of the model. For for example, the locality. Um, but as as I was trying to argue, um, if you think that uh, it, it's rather the it's rather the other way around. Like if you want a a local measurement process that is also deterministic, then that ends up being super deterministic. So I'm I, I'm not a priori too worried about it. Does this make sense? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay.